Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if you haven't uh, been with us for too many minutes, my name is Howard Tuckett. I'm the headmaster at Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong, and you're very welcome uh, to be with us this afternoon. Uh, there are four of us on this panel this afternoon. We're going to be discussing uh, child emotional well-being uh, with a particular view on how we deal with this aspect of our, of our professional lives uh, as teachers of primary age children. And I, I think particularly pertinent, uh, given the very long periods of time children have been spending at home recently with their parents. And this, of course, has given rise to all sorts of anxieties and issues to do with um, emotional well-being. Hopefully that time is behind us now, uh, but it may well be useful just to go over what parents may do and just to do a, a check on how, how um, such situations um, might be managed. So uh, just a few housekeeping things, first of all. We'll be speaking probably for about 30, 35 minutes, after which time we would love to get into the questions. And I would invite you, uh, whilst we're discussing the topics we, we've got prepared for you, uh, do type your questions into the chat box. And as we get to the question and answer session towards the end, uh, we'll, we'll try and answer as many of your questions as we can. Thank you to those of you who've sent questions in ahead of the webinar. And we've actually actively used those to construct uh, the discussion points we'll be opening the first half of the session with. You'll notice none of us are wearing masks, and that is because each one of us is in a separate room from the other one. Uh, we've, we're all linked up on screen, but we thought we could either all sit in one room all masked up, or we could sit in four separate rooms by ourselves unmasked. So we're going for the unmasked version this afternoon. Could I ask everybody who's on the uh, webinar with us this afternoon to mute themselves, except the speakers, of course, um, and then that just prevents any howl around or any uh, echoing or any uh, interrupting sounds happening. And I think let's get straight into it. And uh, let's start off by introducing our panel this afternoon. So my, my three colleagues with us, drawn, not at random, but drawn to select different um, departments, different areas of the school. So starting off with Fred Zhang, who's uh, one of our Chinese language uh, team a team of expert uh, Chinese teachers. We are a British school in Hong Kong. We teach uh, English, the national curriculum for England and Wales with a special view to common entrance. Um, but we balance that with an outstanding Chinese provision. A lot of time in the day is allocated to Chinese and a very high quality of tuition. And Fred is, is a member of that very high functioning and very successful team. So welcome to Fred. We look forward to hearing uh, what you have to share with us. Moving across to Jasmine Vincent. Jasmine has been with us, like Fred, since the school opened in 2019. Jasmine came out from the UK uh, to be with us for the launch and uh, started off as a year four teacher, if I remember correctly, uh, and is currently a year two teacher. So has taught across both key stages uh, within the primary sector. Finally, Matthew Haslam, who joined us shortly after the school opened. Matthew is a year six teacher. Uh, started off teaching the, the eldest class in the school. Of course, the school has now extended. We go all the way up to year eight to 13 plus. And Matthew is still very much a part of the uh, the older uh, provision, uh, year sixes, sevens and eights. Matthew also works on the team who support children who are preparing to go to boarding school in the United Kingdom, as well as teaching mainstream year six subjects. Um, I'm Howard Tuckett, I'm the headmaster and uh, try and keep the whole thing rolling. So let's get straight into it. And Jasmine, I'm going to start with you. And the question I'd like you to start discussing, and I'm sure um, the others will come in after you've uh, gone around uh, the main points of this, is really to set the scene. And, and could you tell us how it is, particularly within our primary context, how mental well-being supports academic learning and academic achievement at school? Sure, thank you, Howard, and hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you all this afternoon. Um, you're going to be hearing this word well-being a lot throughout the course of the webinar today. So I think it's really important that we define what that looks like here at our school. Um, some of you may be familiar with it already, um, but there are a few misconceptions that mental health and well-being are an absence of ill health or needing to be in this constant state of happiness. But that's simply not the case. Well-being is a dynamic state, one where you look at holistically the physical, mental and social well-being um, of each other. And that is enhanced by the personal connections around us, 
having a sense of fulfillment and feeling like you belong to a community. And here at Wickham Abbey, we are very much a community that believe that learning and well-being are closely intertwined. And in fact, are very, very closely connected almost. They, they balance each other out. So if a student is successful in their learning outcomes, then that has a positive effect on their well-being. But their well-being positively influences those um, academic achievement that we see across the school. Obviously, as educators, part of our role is academic, and we set high expectations um, to inspire and motivate our pupils. But we also have another role, which is more pastoral. We have a duty of care to our pupils. And that is a vision that's shared across all members of staff at our school, and is actually embedded in our curriculum too. So we teach sort of skills around well-being and creating those sort of positive um, coping strategies, being able to identify and manage feelings and behaviours explicitly in what we call personal social health education, or PSHE for short. But more importantly, it's um, sort of promoted implicitly by our behaviour and responses to the children around us. So it's something that we're doing all the time here. We have this real culture of care, I feel, here at Wickham Abbey. Um, it's been my personal experience. Um, through all of my connections with my colleagues around me um, to really get to know the child and know what works for them to try and create these positive outcomes. Um, so with well-being, um, simply it can be how you're doing, um, but it's hard to know sometimes how well someone's doing. So there is a model that we use here at Wickham Abbey to help us with that, which is the five ways to well-being. Um, and it's something that we see having equal importance, all of these five components. So I'm just going to share with you now just to give you a bit more of an in-depth look at well-being as we go through the course of the webinar today. Um, so these five components, I'm actually going to go backwards here. Um, let me begin. It's most importantly connections. Um, so making time to um, sort of build and sustain meaningful relationships with others um, around us in our community. Another important aspect of well-being is the importance of physical health and um, making sure that we're active and exercising. There is an importance of having an awareness around us and reflecting on those emotions of others um, as well as of our own this sort of culture of giving so looking after one another doing something nice for others whether that's volunteering or simply showing small acts of kindness and then the final component of well-being is trying to sort of foster that love of learning and that resilience to try new things and challenge so sort of that cyclical nature that we haven't forgotten about academic academic achievement it's very much closely related to well-being and fundamentally I feel that they they can't exist without the other um, you know we want our students to progress and achieve academically but at the same time we want them to um, be able to build meaningful relationships with others develop this sense of what's right from wrong um, and yes be able to um, have sort of successful happy and healthy lives in the future and um, so I think academic achievement and well-being are very um, much um, at core together. Thank you, Jasmine. Fred, I mean, you, you teach one of the probably one of the most complicated subjects in the world, particularly for people who've not spoken to Tonghua before. H how closely linked is a child's positive attitude and mental health to the success of dealing with real academic challenge? Like um, Ms. Vincent just mentioned, as we're working as a whole team in this school, we not only care about the acad academic performance of each student, we care about their emotionally like differences when they step into the classroom. As a language teacher, like I may pick up information from their native language, no matter it's Cantonese or Mandarin, to pick up how the student is feeling on the day and to see if there are gonna be adjustment of my lesson today on specific individual needs of the student. So that's how I pick up as a language teacher to show my like um, sense of, to show how I care about like the students' well-being in my lessons. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, Matthew. For the older ones, you're seeing pupils who are entering teenage. Um, there's a real shift. And I think you've probably got one of the most interesting years, year six, 11 plus. Um, the, 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 the first signs of what a lot of parents fear what's to come for the teenage, which of course we know is a wonderful time. It can be a bit intimidating uh, thinking ahead. How do, how do you as a, 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 class te a class teacher of almost teenagers link the two that mental well health and uh, mental yeah mental well-being and, and academic achievement i'd say it's exactly the same as what jasmine was saying and uh, i want to pick up on that word holistic it's looking at the overall um character of of the student and as, as educators you know we've been very well trained to notice these recognize anything up uh, almost immediately as soon as the students come in the classroom even the tone in which they say good morning i can tell if something's up and i'm i'm, I'm seeing it, fred nodding his head and mr tuckett and and uh, <laughs> miss vincent um as we all know but i'd say almost that um drawing on those um five aspects of well-being um just thinking about how how a student can be best placed to achieve academically um, we, you know, taking all those on board, a student who is free of anxiety, um, in a positive place mentally, um, has lots of trust in the adults around them. I'd say once you have that in place um, and they're in that state of mind, then they have the ability to really flourish academically. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to move on because I can see what's going to happen if we don't uh, sort of keep moving on to questions because there's so much to say on each of these topics. I'm going to move on to Fred to take us on to our next topic. And Fred, could you talk us through how you as a teacher, and we've explained your uh, your particular remit in teaching, how, how are you, um, with so many online lessons over the last few months, how did you ensure, or how did you go about ensuring your pupils' well-being during your um, Putonghua sessions with them? Okay, thank you, Howard, for your question. Uh, hello, everyone, Fred, I'm the Chinese teacher here, here in Wickham Abbey. And as we all know, this whole situation of the pandemic has been affected our life during the last three years, especially on the students' learning process as well. And uh, I think we all agree that um, during this pandemic process, online lesson is the best or the most suitable solution for the students to receive the same quality education in this off and on process. So when we try to design a timetable of the online lessons, we try to make a similar like this timetable in school, which makes the students have a very smooth and natural transition from campus to step study at home to make sure they have uh, quality study time with the, with the teachers. But also we adjust our timetable differently according to the screen time they have to use every day. So we balance the online time and the offline time to make sure uh, the students have some off-screen task every day to make sure they're not using the e-devices a lot. And also when we talk about the online time uh, during the online lessons, it doesn't mean they have to stare at the screen all the time. For example, we have morning stretch with our PE teacher to get moving, to, to get physic physically active, to make sure the students are, are doing something that is very alike in school setting as well. Not only just sitting there at home to, to just stay with the computer for, for the whole time. And also as a language teacher, as a Chinese teacher, um, we have different groups. And in that case, it means like I'm catering uh, some of the students in the whole class group, which means I can better understand what is going on, what is happening with my students. And also I think with such a specific small amount of students we're catering, we have relatively small group, and then we can better know what is what is the best, what is good for the students to, to, to do of the day. And also when we try to design the activities online, we try to make it very diverse and we wanna make it organized and very interactive. Not only just the teachers trying to speak all the time. So we wanna make it very, very, very interactive for the students as well. So sometimes we have like parents on the side participate as well. So we see, oh, this is really working, no, no matter for the students, also for the whole family. We, we see the, 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 the learning vibe is going on in a really yeah. good way, yeah. And also just now when we mentioned about the offline time, I think it's also a good chance for me as a language teacher during my offline time, it's a very good way for me to communicate individually with some of my students. If I think there might be like a little bit emotionally down in the lesson today, I can follow up 
in this offline time. And also I can show how I care about how they're doing this lesson today. If, 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 if they're not doing well because of the emotionally kind of like uh, down of the lesson. So I can do some uh, specific or suitable adjustment after the follow-up or chat or talk with the students. And also I think as a whole school, we also know this is important for the students to have some sort of um, relaxed time during the very intensive online learning period. So like we recently just finished the fun day for the whole school for different stages. I think it's a good chance for the students to see different teachers organize different activities, non-academic or non-teaching activities with the different teachers try to get involved in, in different fun games, activities for them to have a, a very relaxed day to, to, to just finish the, finish the, to wrap up the online learning time. So I think that's from my perspective to, 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 to think about how we care about the well-being in our yeah. school setting and also online learning period. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Fred. It, it was, I think, I think it was a fairly critical lesson we learned very early on was that you cannot run online learning like, like in the same way we could run the school in the normal way. So ha trying to have whole classes on a call at the same time, it just doesn't work. Ch uh, children's attention, our attention to the children, their attention to the lesson, it just didn't work. We learned very early on in the very first lockdown back in early 2020, small groups, lots of appointments, the children would come on several times through the day. They get much more done. They get a lot of break from being on screen and then teachers popping back in for quick chats, quick checkups. Um, and, and by dealing with such small groups, then of course you can get into what's going on in their, their lives with their, with their well-being uh, so much more easily because there is a higher level of privacy uh, with just two or three children on a call rather than um, the whole class at the same time. Matthew, how, how, what sort of, um, uh, I've lost my line. Um, oh yeah, the, the online lessons um, for, your, for your older children, because you were teaching over several subjects. What, what lessons did, did you sort of learn from that time? <clears throat> Excuse me. I guess um, the main thing, the main challenge that I saw was to make them, to keep the students motivated, really. Um, every lesson in, in school, every lesson's in different rooms. They get, to, they get that energizing walk between classrooms, packing up bags, sitting down again, changing seats, sometimes at the back of the classroom, sometimes at the front. And suddenly for the extensive online period, they're on the same desk every day staring at the same little squares on the on the platform. So um, we in the, the older end of the school really tried to make sure that they retain that motivation to learn. And, and expanding on what Fred introduced about these kind of off timetable days we did, uh, me and my colleagues on, on the older end of the school um, came together to, to brainstorm different things that we could do. And we, we held things like show and tell where students had to get items around the the, the house to, to um, show us according to a different theme. Lot saw and met lots of uh, cats and dogs that day. Um, scavenger <laughs> hunts around the school, around the house, you know, to bring me two things that are opposite, to bring me two items that rhyme with each other, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the different tasks like that, a photography competition. So these things that um, really help them uh, re remember this, you know, it's, it's not just listening to this little box in the corner of my teachers, you know, I could just mute them or something. <laughs> like um, uh, we made sure that they kind of retained that element of, uh, of motivation and interest in school. Good, thank you. Let, let's move on. So hopefully uh, lockdown is now gone and it's a thing of the past. We're now going through a really, absolutely, fingers crossed. Uh, we're now going through a really interesting phase. Uh, we're in day four at this school of the children having come back to school. And, and Matthew, what changes are you making as a class teacher to implement or to anticipate any uh, well-being concerns because coming back to school after such a long time it's a big shift particularly in the social context of suddenly being with loads of other children again um, and I know we've, we've all noticed various things already nothing too dramatic but it has been different to the norm. That's right I mean as you can see from uh, what me and Jasmine and Fred have been saying today well-being is a high priority um, for my year six, their last inter uninterrupted year of school was year three. So bearing that in mind, I'm, I'm, I see that as a challenge for me as, as a professional educator of how, how do we address their concerns and, and what changes can we make as they come back to the classroom? 
So day one in the morning farm time, we had a, an open and honest conversation. Uh, what, what, were the, what were the fears or anxieties coming back to, to school, being outside, being on a school bus every day, rather than being in the safety of their homes? Um, and um, it was really nice to hear some of their suggestions um, where, where in the classroom they wanted the hand sanitizer. You know, I can dot them around, but if they say it's easy, it's better for me over here. Perfect. Thanks for telling me that. Um, because at the end of the day, this is our shared workspace and I want them to feel comfortable and ready to learn. Um, so that's how we acted on that. Um, I was also lucky enough to be on the playground duty on the first day and they um, again were a little bit concerned with what kind of sports and games can they play together, whether they can do contact sports or not. Uh, they were a little bit confused so um, I did say okay when we get back to the classroom let's have a little research, let's find some non-contact sports that everyone would be comfortable playing, you know lots of verbal games, lots of kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one races and things like that. So I think that really helped them to settle back in. Um, the one other thing I, I feel I and my colleagues can do as, as educators is to model these uh, good coping mechanisms and good procedures to the children. You know, they, they look towards us with their role models in the same way that their parents are. Uh, but if they've just been seeing parents, um, maybe very close family over the past three or four months. Um, they've not had much exposure to different adults and, and a variety of ways of, of doing things. So small things like when I eat lunch with the students and um, how I take off my mask and put it in, into an envelope or, or a tissue and how I hand san uh, use hand sanitizer before touching food, little things like that. I think that they, they recognize that, they see it, um, they model it and, and imitate it. So just giving them that more exposure to this is, this is what as adults, we all do. It's not just mum and dad at home. Yeah. So these are these are small things that we bring. Uh, I've uh, talked with my colleagues about how we can bring it in and um, just get them comfortable and and feeling that that the um, coming back to school isn't going to be much of a challenge. Thank you, Jasmine. I know I know for a lot of people who have joined us on the webinar this afternoon, uh, one of the burning questions because it came up so much in the uh, in all the pre questions we got. Were, were tips and suggestions for parents to help them monitor their own child's well-being at home. Um, and, you know, I, I know as a parent, sometimes you're so close to your own children that it's really hard to see uh, because you just know them so well. And actually, it's very helpful to have somebody who's like a teacher who's not quite so um, ingrained in the family to have that more objective view. So, so maybe you could take us through some um, how you can monitor and support your child's well-being at home? Definitely, Howard, I think it's a really important question. Um, and as you touched on, it's natural for families, parents, caregivers to experience sort of heightened anxiety during these times. And, um, you know, we've gone through long periods of uncertainty, all of us, which will probably have an impact on our mental health and well-being. But there are ways that we can work together to support children's well-being. Um, and do that as a team approach. So I'm actually going to answer this question in, in two parts. So the first part um, I want to talk about is identi identifying some sort of signs um, and symptoms um, that you might uh, be aware of um, when thinking about your child's mm -hmm. well-being. And then the second part, um, some ways that you might um, go about managing um, your child's well-being, how you can sort of start those conversations, perhaps, um, with, if you not sort of had experience of doing that before. So um, kind of signs to look out for. I think it's really important to recognize that every child is different. Um, and I would start off by saying that it's important to think of the question, what would worry you about your child? Um, and come up with a list of things um, that would be seen as, I quote, like abnormal for your child specifically. So as an example, if your child is quite loud, um, outgoing um, and social usually, and then they suddenly become quite quiet and withdrawn, that would be unusual for that child. Um, sort of alternatively, if you have a quite quiet, genteel, studious child and they suddenly become quite irritable, um, you know, quite aggressive, that would be unusual for that specific child. These could be signs um, 
of some sort of common mental conditions, um, such as anxiety and depression. Um, but again, you have to look at holistically the whole child and the context specifically. So there are some symptoms you can look out for, um, such as forgetfulness, um, withdrawal, loss of engagement in activities that they usually love, um, sort of any changes in appetite or um, sleep disturbance, um, maybe experiencing sort of feelings of worthlessness or guilt. Um, but again, they have to be looked at in context. So as um, you mentioned, Mr. Tuckett, having those conversations with the educators who do also see your child a lot, we can sort of work together as a team approach to identify, is this unusual? Is there something going on? And then next, how can we approach it? So um, what we need to do first of all is create, and Matt actually spoke about creating a safe space in school. It's really important to have that space, safe space at home as well. Home should be a place of security. Um, positive family relationships are really closely associated with well-being. Um, sort of, as Fred mentioned, a place of security, somewhere where you can have time uh, to rest and play, and not just, you know, focusing on homework and having sort of any battles. There, there needs to be that recuperation and, and safe space to talk about feelings, but they might not know how to talk about feelings. So as Matt said, how we talk about our feelings really matters. Um, we should try and approach it in a calm, considered, matter-of-fact way, relevant to um, that child's level of intellect and interest. Um, and sort of a mantra that I sort of live by personally and professionally is um, responding rather than reacting. And it's not always easy, um, but I try and respond, why is a child acting a certain way? Um, and not just reacting to it sudden, you know, and blowing up or um, trying to approach it more in this calm way where I can listen to the child without judgment and help them process those emotions, remind them of times that they've dealt with things well, involve them in the problem solving. Sometimes that might be empowering them by giving them more control and choice. That might be a case of um, involving them in what they wear or what they're having for lunch or involving them in jobs around the house. But at the same time, it's important, I think, on the other hand, to set boundaries as well. So, and like I said, having that boundary of, of homework and play um, and supervising technology, that it does really need to work together, um, I think, to um, really support child's well-being. But fundamentally, I think um, it's hard to take care of anyone's well-being and monitor it and, and help children process it if we're not looking after our own. So we really want as educators, you to work together with us and we can work from support plans and, and how we can approach this together. And there are some external um, reliable sources that you can go to for extra support as well. And um, some based in Hong Kong, you probably saw it flash up on the screen earlier. Um, but here we have by the Hong Kong uh, Jockey Club here. There we are. Uh, there are some weekly parent support groups, um, which you can scan the codes um, or screenshot now if you would like some sort of extra information because I try and model to my people that it's okay to ask for help. I don't have all the answers. Um, so it's the same for us as adults. We might not have all the answers. So that's where we can really work together to support um, children's well-being as a team. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, you touched on a really good point there a child's need in fact anybody's need for rest and for a safe space and uh, i'm sure this is going to come up in the questions so uh, i'm not really going to open this particular um, topic at the moment but of course a safe space and a rest from social media um, children need a break the 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 the, 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 the correlation between children's interaction on social media with other children and their mental health is a real thing. And w when I was at school, which was a very long time ago when I was at school, but and I'm sure it was the same for most of the panel here, when we got home from school as children, the school day was over. We didn't have our whole class in, in our ear, in our bedroom, as it, which can easily be achieved at the moment. And all that interaction and the tensions and the chat and who's friends with who and who doesn't like who and who's maybe not being very kind everybody needs a break from that but if children have got their phones on in their 
in their quiet evening time, there is just never any break and there is a definite correlation. So as a tip to parents, that's always something uh, to monitor. Good, right, let's move on. Um, time is galloping by. Fred, um, as a language specialist teacher, how do you use, you, you get the children for a lesson or a double period in the day. So you're not a class teacher with a pastoral role of one group, but we all have a pastoral group, but your formation is different because you have four or five year groups who you see through the week. Um, how do you support this constant sort of fluctuation of children coming in and out of your sphere of influence? What, what are the systems at school? If you spotted something in a class, do you think, as Matthew said just now, aha, something's not quite right there, but you're not the class teacher. How do you as a member of staff deal with that? Okay, thank you, Howard. Um, as we all know, we are a private British school and uh, compared with other schools, maybe probably as a language or a Chinese teacher, they probably see their students once a week or twice a week. But luckily here in Wicom Abbey, I'm seeing my students of year, different year groups every day in my uh, Chinese lessons. So basically cover all the year groups of different case stages. So which give me a lot more time to better know the students, to better know the students, maybe not as much as the class teacher is Getting, with, uh, getting well with the students every day. I'm meeting them every day. And also, which provides me enough time to know the students well as well. So during my Chinese lessons, I can feel of the students, how they're behaving, how they're doing, how they're feeling of the day uh, when they step into the Chinese classroom. Uh, for example, for my groups, I have a lot of students whose uh, mother language, mother tongue is Chinese, no matter it's Cantonese or Mandarin Chinese. I think, first of all, I need to build up a very positive teacher-student relationship. They need to have this trust to trust, oh, teacher is the person that I can talk to, that I can share my feeling of the day to. So in that case, I think some of the students, a lot of the students, they feel very comfortable to use their native language to share their thoughts or their feeling of the day, no matter it's during the online lesson time or after the term break or after the holidays they feel very, uh, very, very comfortable to share what they're feeling inside as well. So um, I think it's a matter of like, they're using the language, they feel comfortable to share information to the teacher. And also when I raise up, when I, when I realized if their student happened to have an issue, for, for sure, first of all, as a class, as a, as a language teacher, I need to talk to the student individually to see what is happening, what is going on. And then after the Chinese lesson, First, for, first of all, I will go to the class teacher straight away to, to, to have this peer communication for sure, to, to make sure the class teacher know what is happening, what is happening with the student in my Chinese lesson, or when the student mentioned about some issues they feel about or they struggle with in this learning process or, or happening uh, several days ago or yesterday, something like that. Then if I feel like there is an issue I need to raise up to let other teachers know, let other um, related teacher who is teaching the student to know, we're having a system in school called ISAMS. I'll write down everything specifically related to the student that the issue I'm thinking about, the concern I, I, I think of, of the student. Then all the follow-up teachers will see what is happening, what I gathered as part of the information to share with all my colleagues, then they will follow up. At least they will have a signal already on their iPad or to know, oh, I need to, I need to, I need to, um, to, 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 to see what is happening for the rest of the day when the students yeah. step into my lessons. So I think uh, this very positive uh, peer communication uh, helps us a lot to better understand what is happening with the specific student, no matter if it's in Chinese or in drama or in art or in PE, we're working as a whole team to, to collect the information or data together to, to monitor the student together. And, I, and also I think after that, we have very positive uh, parent teacher communication to make sure what do we gather in school is also the positive feedback for, this, for the parent to know what is happening today with my child. If there anything we need to talk with the, with the parent as well to, to, to go through what is happening as well. So I think yeah. this whole healthy communication system which helps us a lot to, 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 to communicate, no matter in school or outside of the school with the parent. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a culture at the school that it is everybody's responsibility to be alert to children's well-being. Uh, yes. So Ma Matthew, let, let me, if you, maybe you could, um, taking what Fred has just said, maybe you could just run us through the specific systems that we have, apart from a general culture, as, as Jasmine said, 
a culture mm -hmm. of well-being. Maybe you could take mm -hmm. us through for parents to understand that this doesn't happen by accident or it's not an ad hoc sort of if we feel like it kind of aspect of what we do. Um, just run up our guests through how we actually monitor children's mental health at school. Um, I think I want to start with the step before that, if I may, and just say, show how Fred or Miss Vincent or myself may first recognise these, because we're, we're going off the assumption that, say, Fred has seen um, a, a student a bit with abnormal behaviour, but how does he recognise that? And I think the first thing that I want to share is that uh, the school puts us through these professional developments um, every term, whereby we do these courses. Um, and I just want to share three of the titles with you because they're almost perfect for this discussion. One is to understand low mood and depression for international schools. Another one is understanding anxiety for international schools. And then finally, children's mental well-being for international schools. So to have these topics as part of our requirements as, as employees, as, as teachers and educators, uh, which are then refreshed every two years as well, is something that this school has uh, enabled us as teachers uh, as a tool in our toolkit to be able to recognize anything, um, any of the abnormal behaviors or uh, um, any problems that the students might have. So after we have uh, recognized these through this um, training, um, like um, Fred said, the, um, we have a well-being tracker. So if Fred is a specialist or someone else, uh, you know, a different teacher of a different class or a teaching assistant notices anything, they put it onto this platform in which I will get an email notification. I can go through it and read the description about what's happening. If obviously a few of these come, of multiple notifications, then it might, the concern will grow and then it's time for me to act on it. Um, as, as a school, we also have a safeguarding committee that meets every two weeks to go through these concerns and, and decide any action um, or, or any results from that and whether parents need to get in, involved. Um, one thing I'd say um, for our school particularly is um, how important our teaching assistants are to this whole process, because they are the ones that follow the class around all day I frequently catch up with, with my teaching assistant in between lessons or break times and lunches just to track how the students are doing. Um, I, I'm not a drama teacher, for example, so I like to check in to see how the students were with drama, which is obviously much more expressive and um, performative subject. Um, and then similarly for, for Fred, as he said, uh, he teaches some of the native speaking uh, Chinese students. So if they happen to have uh, lower English abilities, maybe Fred is the, the type of teacher they would approach with any problems. And then Fred can obviously communicate that to me through uh, the, the teaching assistant or through our wellbeing tracker. So um, the importance of our teaching assistants is, is crucial to that whole process. And I think as you can see from, from our training and from our processes and our structure, the three that I've mentioned here, you can see how well um, well-being is embedded into our school culture. Thank you. I, I think uh, coming back to uh, points that have been made before, that during the lockdown, the school remained on duty in terms of child well-being mm -hmm. all the time. And we made plenty of calls between parents and the school, even though we hadn't actually seen the children in school for many weeks. There were plenty of examples where colleagues and parents were talking about parents' concerns, or sometimes even teachers' concerns from what they'd observed online. Um, so the, the school takes its duty of care for the child's well-being uh, very seriously. And just because we were locked down and we couldn't physically have children, it didn't mean that that work stopped. Our, our fortnightly meetings for safeguarding and well-being carried on online. Um, and pretty much that aspect, it was almost ran better than the academic work because it's just easy to do it needs, it needs people to communicate and to talk and to share knowledge um and, and that went on pretty much uninterrupted um if any any of our guests do have questions do feel free uh, to type them into the chat i've got my you might see my eyes moving around i've got about six screens going on in front of me here um, but i've got the chat box open here in front of me um, but don't worry we've got plenty to talk about so don't feel the need but if there's something you would like to ask do type that in. The um, next thing I'd like to come on to is the um, 
the, the, the lack of society for our children. Jasmine, I'm going to ask you to comment on this. To what level does a child being withdrawn from the normal society of other children impact on their social health from your observation? As sort of as I mentioned before, um, when we were speaking about ways that we can sort of identify any concerns that a child may be struggling with their well-being, that it's important to recognise that every child is different, um, and that all of us, um, children, parents, teachers, are going to have had different experiences of online learning during the lockdown period. Some of those may have been positive. I've seen children come back. Um, sort of with increased independence, um, sort of with more empathy, better time management, um, and real sort of positive behaviours. At the same time, um, I've got some students who will take a little bit longer to adjust, um, but that's okay because as sort of Fred mentioned earlier, we can tailor things specifically to the children. That's what part of our holistic vision is here at Wickham Abbey, um, is that we don't expect children to um, adhere to our school and mold and adapt to what we want, but we can sort of tailor things specifically to their needs. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, obviously, everyone has missed that collaboration, um, sort of interaction with peers. We have been able to do that to some capacity online with, you know, things like the breakout rooms, or we've been sort of very good, Matt mentioned our training, we've also had training with technology in regards to our programs with Microsoft. Um, so we're used to sort of collaborative tools, we have those um, collaboration notebooks with Microsoft OneNote, we have the breakout rooms with Teams, um, we sort of create those open channels where children can communicate with us um, and with each other as well. We sort of um, had a lot of social calls, um, Matt mentioned the show and tell, um, I didn't get cats and dogs, I got iguanas, um, just not, not to brag. Um, so, you know, we, we were able to do that, but I think the importance is, is that we've all had to adapt um, and learn. And, you know, we are going to be, we are going to carry on adapting. And some children, it may take a little bit longer to get used to coming back to school. And for others, they it's like they've not been away. But what we do here at Wickham Abbey is make sure that everyone gets to the place that we want them to be to sort of have that um, sort of well-being and the positive outcomes eventually here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Matthew and or Fred, do, do chip in. The, the, the significance of society for children, the society of other children or indeed other adults other than their own immediate family. I think um, um, one of the challenges, and kind of building on what I, I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges is that only seeing mum and dad for so many mums are, in, are, as I said, close family. Um, I, I, I was concerned that that may have limited uh, my students' exposure to, to people, different people, rich and poor, different coloured skin, tall and short people, you, you know, because um, um, seeing that variety um, that diversity in the world, which, you know, Hong Kong's an international city and to see, um, to be limited almost by, by staying in and, and learning indoors. Uh, that's one thing that I um, have, have, have been a little bit concerned with, you know, even just, I'd say a trip to the cinema or a trip to the swimming pool, which has not been, been able to happen for the past couple of months. Uh, the, the children can gain that exposure to different people and, and learn what society is like. How does that person cross the road? How does that person shop? Oh, they use a card, not cash. Little things like that, which kind of open their mind to the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing that I, I hope in the months to come that um, they can catch up on really. And, and some of the skills that we, we teach them in, in terms of like in inclusivity, um, respect for others, um, patience. These are the things that we teach um, in PSHE lessons, as Jasmine mentioned earlier. Um, in just general, um, as we as we line up in in the class and get them um, interacting with each other, and and we we I think our challenge now as we come back is to reaffirm these skills with them, and, and you know they, they they've got we we have different households here, and they need to understand that the way that the, they interact with say brother and sister, mum and dad, 
is very it's very different to others yeah thank you let's move on to the area of academic competition and academic achievement being a cause of mental anguish for young people fred uh, what are your thoughts about i think it's very easy to say the dangers of of, of mental competitiveness uh, sometimes even being brought on by by parents who are overly um ambitious for, the, for their children uh, but sometimes children put these pressures on themselves uh, they are naturally they naturally want to do well and, and can really sort of drive themselves down into a negative place what, what, what is your observation on all of that in our in our life as teachers? That, especially in asian culture like mm. being competitive you need to try your best you know strive for the best is something maybe we were taught when we were a little kid we need to try our best all the time you know in the class we need to 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 to, to perform the best when it comes there's a their competition or examination or quiz or test that's what we were being taught so i think as in an international school setting uh we we always encourage students to try their best to be courageous to try so we try to not make the competition part very, very straightforward for the students. You need to try your best in the examinations. We always say, you can try. It's okay. Sometimes we make mistakes. We might, we might, we might not try our best for some occasions. That's okay. So I think it's really a matter of like, when a school setting or family setting, how we have, as teachers, adults, try to get line the students. You, you encourage them to try their best, but not giving them the pressure directly from your language or from the way you want it straightforward to students because they, they can feel it when, when the parent or the teacher straight straightforward tell them you need to do your best in this specific occasion or examination or test or quiz. They feel that this, this, they're, they're very smart to pick up the information from the parents or from the teachers. So we try to make the wording soft and make them easy to accept and adjust, then they can try their best. So sometimes maybe not being so 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 stressed or so so straight with them, they might give you more surprises on the way of learning, on the way of being the best that they think yeah. they can be. So yeah. that's that's what I feel like as a language te teacher's perspective. So uh, instead of asking them to 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 do do a lot of things, I just want to see how much they can give me, they can offer me. In this process, I may see a lot of surprises when they when they feel free to 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 open up to show what they. With what they know, what they what they want to learn in the process. I think it's fair to say in, in the school we have a culture that comp competition or competitiveness isn't necessarily a bad thing, but competition, particularly for primary age children, is best used when children are being challenged to achieve against what they are capable of achieving. But we're not too worried about how they're achieving compared to the person beside them. That's a that's a different issue. We're not comparing children with children. We're comparing the child. With what that child's capable of have you done your best and we don't worry about how you're doing compared to the the other children around you yeah it's more like yeah, a competition between himself yeah like exactly and your yeah. best of yesterday yeah. your best than last term than last year that's what we're expecting yeah. which is why we spend so much time measuring cognitive ability so we know what we can expect we know what we could achieve if the holistic side the, the mental well-being and the attitude to learning are all there. Jasmine, I'm, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Um, our friend Vivian has um, from um, British Chamber of Commerce has just come in with a question. And it's about the whole area of how, yeah, you know, what's the phrase? There's a lovely phrase. I can't, sorry, I'm going to spin, fiddle around here. It's the I've lost it. I can't, I can't, I'm just trying to scroll through. Still, I've, it, I've it, actually um, got the, the chat box open on my screen. It, so it's about the labelling of mental health. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody breaks an arm and you ask them, how are you feeling? They'll probably talk to you for 20 minutes to the point where you're quite bored about hearing about their broken arm. If you ask somebody about their mental health, we don't like talking about that. We're quite happy to talk about our physical health. Um, in fact, in, in a lot of cultures, we joke about how much people talk about their illnesses and their ailments, mm -hmm. but people don't like talking about mental health issues. And of course, this creates a massive block to being able to talk to anybody, pupils, parents, or, or indeed colleagues, because I think I don't think this is a cultural thing. Um, 
I have heard a lot in Hong Kong that it tends to be the culture of Hong Kong. Well, you know, I've lived in Africa for many years. I've lived in the UK for many years. This is not a Hong Kong thing. This is a human thing. Uh, this is this is across all cultures. There is some sort of feeling that we're 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 admitting to failure if we admit to having any kind of mental health issues. That might be putting it a bit strongly, but it's certainly a complex. Um, Jasmine, what are your thoughts and feelings, and how do we help people overcome this? Yeah, um, I've got Vivian's um, exact oh, you words can see it. open okay. up on the screen, um, and actually described as a stigma towards mental That's the health. Word. Which, well done. Yeah, um, which was uh, exactly right. I, I mentioned at the beginning about sort of common misconceptions when we talk about mental health and well-being as um, sort of this absence of uh, ill health. Um, like you mentioned, Howard, we're sort of only talking about the, the outside, the physical. And I think, you know, sometimes we, we want quick fixes and we feel that we have to suppress um, the emotions that we have inside of us um, because of sort of society, societal expectations. Um, but I think a way of overcoming that, obviously, through um, sort of media and, and sort of culture, popular culture now, and mental health is more spoken about. Um, in fact, maybe some of our children are more aware of how to speak about it than we are as adults. And I think that comes down to the language that we use. Um, so, you know, I spoke about um, sort of recognizing, being able to identify our feelings um, and knowing that sort of anger, anxiety, depression, um, they are all normal feelings. They are all natural. We will experience them at one time or other in our life. Um, but then what, how, what do we do with that afterwards? So at our school, we have um, sort of a, a program called the Zones of Regulation, which is used from Key Stage 1 right up until Key Stage 2. And we're actually giving children a language to articulate and communicate their feelings with us. Um, and that's done right from, you know, as they step inside the door. Um, how was your experience on the bus this morning? Because as Matt mentioned, the bus is actually... Um, it can be quite a, a trigger of anxiety um, for a lot of children, especially as that said, they've spent a lot of a long time at home. Um, and then it's done throughout the day. It's something that we're constantly using and, and thinking and questioning as well. Um, and then, OK, if we are feeling a little bit low, maybe quite tired, what can we do about that? What strategies do we know? So we're giving children, um, trying to help them find ways to to cope with their feelings. So I think, yes, it is definitely developing this stigma against mental health, but we've spoken a lot about um, sort of modeling our responses and how we um, sort of deal with our own mental health and well-being. And I think that's really picked up on by our students. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they are taking much more ownership of their mental health and well-being now, mm -hmm. something that we've seen here. Um, it's definitely something that we need to, it's, you know, it's a process, it's something we need to continue to work on, and we do that sort of together, um, and hopefully we're all heading in the same direction. Vivian actually mentioned, I'm going to ask some of the other teachers, um, about if you've ever come across a situation where um, a parent has different views or values to you, and how you sort of approach that together, so when you're sort of advising um, or modeling a response that you may suggest for a child um, and then the parent may have a different approach and um, what do we do when we sort of come we feel like there might be conflict in that so I don't know if Matt or Fred you've ever experienced that in your professional careers. I think for the parent sometimes when they have a different approach mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's a conflict of what you're teaching in school what values you're teaching I think most of the parents, they're holding the same value. They just want to use a different way to approach their child at mm -hmm. home to give them, like to deliver the values or deliver the things they wanted them to, to learn at home. I think it's a, it, like you mentioned, each, each child has its own story. Mm -hmm. This storybook might be a better understanding for the parent at home because they know much better than the teachers at school. They know much more stories of their own child. So they might feel like there's a, very good way or suitable way for their child to, to, to accept, to receive those values or messages from their perspective. So I don't think it's really like a conflict of what we're teaching in school. I think it's more like how they deliver it, how they want to make it very naturally for, the, for their kids, for their child, to, to, for their children to, to accept it, to receive it. 
from from their uh, yeah. very comfortable environment. I think I think Jasmine, you said the word yourself. We suggest. Yeah. Um, you know, we we would never presume to to parent to parent for parents. We are here as a resource. We make suggestions and offer guidance, which they may or may not take. Matthew. And just to add to that, I think uh, it fundamentally it comes down to what we've the first topic we discussed here about well-being and academic achievement being connected in that um, in, in, in examples that, that I've experienced, um, I start by saying at the end of the day, I, I and my colleagues are here because we care about your, your child's academic achievement. We care about their, their well-being together. And just to, to echo what Fred said, it, it, the, the processes may be different at home and school. And there is a fine line between where school stops and home starts, similarly where, where home stops and school starts. But um, I, I found that in my experience, many parents are very reassured when they hear those words come out of my mouth that I, we do care about this. You know, we're not, we're not paid salary on commission of, of grades going up every time we entered this profession because we care and we want to improve students' um, academic achievement and well-being at this, in, in, um, in tandem. Um, so I think in my experience, when those words come out of my mouth, then parents are, are much more reassured. Thank you. I can't believe it, but we, so, we, are, oh, we are out can of I time. Add, Go on, um, so Jasmine, sorry. Jasmine, a final word from each one of you. We'll start with Jasmine. And we'll oh, I'm just going to say, Vivian specifically mentioned children feeling torn um, between um, sort of educators and parents. I just want to reiterate what Matt said is that, um, you know, ultimately we're united in that we care about the child um, and their well-being. That's what connects us. As Fred said, we might have different approaches, but fundamentally we'll never go against the parent. We want to work with you together because the child is the most important part um, of our job. So yeah. that's just what I wanted to add. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's a partnership between school and parents and no child will be served by any torsion between parents or, or teaching staff. We will advise, support, and, and help you as best we can if you ask us to. Um, Fred? I think uh, for the sharing part from my perspective today, I think, like Jasmine mentioned about, you need to know your child. In school, for the teachers, you know your students well, because you're meeting them every day, no matter as a language teacher or as a class teacher. So better communication, good communication with your students, with your child to make sure you know what is happening, what is going on with, with him or her, then try to talk to him or her as an adult, no matter from a teacher's perspective or from the parent perspective, then find out a solution for your child with, together with working with like no matter school or working you know, together family with mom or dad like that, try to, try to solve the problem eventually. Try Thank to, you. Yeah. Thanks, Fred. Final word from you, Matthew. Um, I'd just like to um, kind of um, praise the structure that we've got at our school. As soon as I joined the school, I've been very impressed with um, the structures we have in place for the well-being of students. And I'm very proud to be part of, of everything that we're, that's going on here because I feel that as an educator, my concerns for my students and, and how they operate and how they go around the school are, are well taken care of. I feel well trained uh, and I feel like I have the resources through teaching assistants. I noticed Vivian said that um, she was one before. Um, so um, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to be part of a, a, this school as a project uh, um, that have given me these resources as an educator. Thank you all very much. We, we are over time. I can't believe an hour has just fled away like that. Um, we haven't covered nearly anything we could have spoke, everything we could have spoken about, but hopefully our guests have found this useful. I think Karen's going to um, going to put a slide up um, for us now that we'll be able to see for anybody who might like to uh, get in touch with the school. And we'd be very grateful for your feedback on how useful you found this webinar. Uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much uh, to Fred, to Jasmine and to Matthew. And thank you to everybody who's joined us this afternoon. Uh, do come and visit us here at Wickham Abbey if you don't know the school. Uh, we look forward to meeting you and uh, to getting to know you better. Thank you very much and good evening.